it, it, it'll pick you up. It's, it's a real good tape recorder. <laughs> uh, what years have you served in the Kansas House? I was elected first in uh, 1986, so my first session was uh, 1987, and uh, now that we're in the 1991 session, it's the start of my third term. Okay. And you've been in the House all three Yes. Years. This is your third yes. session in the House then. And you're a Democrat, is that correct? I am. Uh -huh. Can you tell me uh, why and when you're affiliated with the party, with the Democratic Party? I have always been a registered Democrat. Uh, interestingly enough, however, I, uh, my activities have always been of a very nonpartisan nature. Um, I was um, very involved in community affairs in a very nonpartisan role as president of the League of Women Voters and uh, as a board member of the State League of Women Voters and as uh, chairman of the board of the Johnson County Community College. And uh, as you know, the community college boards in our state are elected boards, but they're nonpartisan elections, uh, countywide nonpartisan election. Um, so that, plus a number of other things, um, had gotten me very involved in, in the political scene, but always in a nonpartisan context. Um, so although I've always been a registered Democrat, I was never involved in party, in party politics at all until I decided to run for the legislature. Oh, that's interesting. Well, uh, why did you decide to run for the legislature? Principally because I was dissatisfied with the representation that was being provided for the district that I live in. Um, and um, I had gotten extremely involved in community uh, affairs um, and um, felt that um, I could do the job better than uh, it was being done. Uh, and for that reason I chose to challenge the incumbent. Uh, which was no easy chore because of the fact that the district that I reside in um, is a very, very heavily Republican district. And uh, my opponent, of course, was a Republican incumbent. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather than take the advice of many who advised me to run against him as a Republican and switch my party registration, I chose not to do that and take the harder route um, and uh, run as a Democrat in a very, very Republican county. My goodness, that's pretty brave. Uh, did, who encouraged you to run? Did you have anyone encouraging you all along here or talking to you about it? Or? I, uh, I was encouraged by a number of people, but um, I, uh, I don't feel that um, that was any factor in my decision. And uh, quite frankly, um, as a woman involved in politics, I uh, feel oftentimes what I like to call the draft mythology uh, is something that uh, women seem to think exists and it uh, serves as an impediment to their actually choosing to run for office. They have this uh, feeling that uh, they have to be courted and begged to run by many, many people before uh, they would consider doing it. And I don't believe that's the reality at all. Mm. Uh, I, I certainly had a number of people encouraging me to do it, but uh, throngs don't knock at your door and beat it down to try to make you uh, do something if you don't really have that initiative on your own. Very profound. That's great. Uh, you say other people talk to you about it. Now, did these people come from uh, the League of Women Voters or any of the groups that you had participated in? Okay. Yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, Were they women, men, or everybody? <coughs> a combination. Uh, very supportive from the people with whom I worked. And I've served on, I did then and still do serve on many community boards and um, colleagues on these boards uh, encouraged me, um, media people encouraged me, and um, legislators. 
good from our uh, delegation encouraged me, although they were from the other party. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. You said you ran against an incumbent the first time. Can you describe your other elections? Or? The second time, the incumbent whom I defeated ran against me. So the first two times I ran, I ran against the same gentleman. <laughs> um, and uh, the third time, um, which is just this last uh, election, um, I, uh, my opponent was a, a new young man uh, in Johnson County who now, it's an, uh, interestingly enough, has been elected to serve as the county chairman of the Republican oh, Party. And my former opponent is the county treasurer of the, of the Republican Party. Well, I, we're getting together there, it sounds like. How did you campaign in these elections? Did you uh, have a door-to-door, -door yard yes, sign, or what, what did you emphasize and think was most important? I, <clears throat> I think the most important thing that I did was the door-to-door. -door. I knocked on every door in my district. I started um, July and uh, ended um, this past year, Monday, the Monday before Election Day, previous to that, Sunday before Election Day, and every day and every night um, I walked the streets. In addition to that, I um, had a very strong direct mail campaign, which is very costly, mm -hmm. but also very effective. Um, I felt that I had a message that I wanted to impart to the people in my district, uh, and um, I had to reach them. And the only way I could do it is standing on their doorstep or getting into their mailbox. Um, <laughs> And I used both methods. Uh, very little as far as um, newspaper. Okay. Uh, How about television? And none at all. No radio or TV at all. Hmm. Uh, the thrust was um, door to door and direct mail. Okay. How did you finance your campaign and the, well, the expensive mail campaign in particular? By fundraising, uh, by uh, asking uh, everyone I knew to contribute. Um, I um, depended upon individual contributions, and um, I, I found, much to my surprise, not having been in this before, uh, the first time I ran, that people really do uh, want to be supportive uh, financially in an election campaign if they think that there's a cause mm -hmm. that's worth supporting. Um, and so I, I just solicit individual contributions. Now, we've heard from other uh, women legislators that it might be a little more difficult for a woman to, to raise finances for a campaign. And you were running against an incumbent on top of that. Do you think those two factors were factors in fundraising or not? Uh, yes. Uh, and I, again, uh, think that women candidates are um, uh, a little atypical uh, in the fundraising area, not because they would have difficulty in raising money because they're women, but because they are more reluctant to ask for money. Uh, women, I think, in general, are much more reluctant to engage in the fundraising than a male counterpart might be. And I suppose there's some sociological reason for that, but I certainly can't diagnose it. I fall into that category. Uh, I do not like to do that. Uh, I find it difficult uh, to ask friends for money for myself. I have no problem in asking money for money for a charitable cause, but here you're asking yeah. for money for you, yeah. uh, for your, your use in, in getting yourself elected. Mm -hmm. And you have to get over that hurdle. Once you get over that hurdle, it's much easier. And um, so the first time, I, I had a, some difficulty with doing that. Um, and uh, I would try to delegate that to others. Uh, but s very, very early on, realized that those people from whom you would like the most money expect you yourself to ask for it. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, once I realized that, I decided, well, if you're going to do this, you're just going to have to get over that hump. Well, you mentioned that the, maybe some folks from the media talked to you and encouraged you to run. Did I understand you to say that? There were some of them, uh -huh. yes. Well, how did the media treat you? Do you think they, did they endorse you or uh, anything <laughs> special? Um, the first time I ran, I was, um, I was endorsed strongly by the Kansas City Star, which was very important to me. Uh, I was told that I would be endorsed by the local newspaper, and um, at the last minute they um, apparently changed their mind about endorsing the um, Democratic candidate for governor mm -hmm. in that race, and uh, as a result, um, listed under their endorsement page in my race no endorsement in this race they endorsed neither my mm. inc the incumbent um, opponent of mine nor me however they gave a very glowing um, account of what i had done in the community uh -huh. and ended with no endorsement in this race oh huh. that's an interesting uh, it, it was an interesting. What, what newspaper was that that did that? That's the Sun the newspaper. Sun. Um, the uh, second time I ran um, in '88, uh, I uh, received a very, very strong endorsement from them. And this last time that I ran, I received a really exceptionally well done endorsement, which I think was very helpful to me. Okay. Well, had, did anyone precede you in the legislature, in your family, in your immediate circle of friends, anywhere no. down the line? You have no connections like that. But no. Okay. That's, some people do and some don't. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Now, you talk about your district and you're in Kansas City, Johnson County, right? Uh, yes. And uh, what, what, can you describe your district a little bit? Well, uh, my district, I live in Prairie Village, mm -hmm. which is one of the cities in Johnson mm -hmm. County. However, my district um, is composed of 15 precincts. Um, 12 of those are in Overland Park, and three are in Prairie Village, and they are adjoining cities. Um, mm -hmm. uh, each of those cities is represented by a number of representatives. We now have 18 members of the House from Johnson County, mm -hmm. so uh, no one represents the entire Overland mm -hmm. Park or the entire Prairie Village. Really. Who's the senator in your... My, I have two senators oh, yeah, two. that represent my uh, house district. One is uh, Senator Bond and the other is Senator Langworthy. Okay, what uh, issues have been important to people in your district during your campaigns and during your time in office? Are there any really issues that you identify that are special? Your district? Yeah. My district is very concerned with, um, right now, uh, property tax issues. Um, and I think that's probably true of all of Johnson County, and increasingly so for other areas mm -hmm. of the state. Um, it's a prime concern of theirs. Um, they're very concerned with education related issues, both on the uh, um, K through 12 level and on the uh, post and secondary level. Um, they are very concerned with um, health related issues and I perceive this as something that more and more people are becoming vocally concerned about uh, and uh, it is one of the reasons why I agreed to chair the House Public Health and Welfare Committee because I, I truly believe that uh, until we address some of the problems of affordable and accessible health care, not only in our state, but in the nation, um, our budgetary problems and all the rest are not going to be resolved mm -hmm. properly. Um, so I, I think uh, those are some of, the, some of the major areas of concern. I have a large portion of my district that are um, older adults mm -hmm. and I have long been involved in um, issues of concern to um, uh, 
elder, the elderly uh, and uh, have um, really worked in this area. I co-chaired the Johnson County ElderNet Coalition, oh. which has prepared a long-term master plan for the provision of services to older adults in our county that is now serving as a model in the state mm -hmm. and elsewhere. So I've been really involved in that thrust mm -hmm. as well. A lot of these issues that you uh, you have mentioned, they're really important to people in your district and to you both. What about any other issues that have been real important while you've been here in the legislature? I've been I've been pretty involved in quite a number of areas. Uh, one is I, I uh, chaired the Democratic Caucus's task force on children and family uh, concerns. I've also two years ago last year. Uh, I chaired the caucus's task force on SRS, which is the Department of Social and Rehabilitative Services, and got very involved in the whole um, uh, problem of um, trying to provide public assistance and health care in, in, our, in our state. Um, I have also been very involved in ethics legislation. Uh, I've served on the elections committee. And um, I uh, served on every subcommittee, and there were at least three during the last session on ethics legislation. I don't know why, but I was just appointed to each of these, and it, uh, it, it, it just kind of steered me into a real inquiry into the need for, um, for increased um, provisions in our ethics laws and campaign finance laws. And I, authored a number of bills in that area and was very involved last year in, in, in that as well. Um, so those, those have been some of the primary areas. Well, those have all been big issues across the state. I continued. Yeah. Are there any issues that you could identify as women's issues? Uh, do you think there are women's issues that maybe women legislators have more or less uh, been? Interestingly enough, my my feeling on that is that um, years ago, you could certainly categor categorize issues as women's issues, family-oriented issues, uh, child-related concerns, education issues. Um, and in large measure, um, socially-oriented social programs. These were also kind of categorized as Democratic Party issues philosophically, as opposed to Republican Party issues. Um, I submit that that is no longer the case, either as far as women's issues are concerned or partisan issues are concerned. These issues that were, at one time, women's agenda, in quotes, issues, have become the primary issues of concern uh, that every uh, reasonable member of this legislature has got to address. How, how recently <coughs> do you think that change has occurred? Uh, I think it's been an evolving situation, but I think within the last three or four years, mm -hmm. it has become very apparent to everyone that those issues that were typically looked upon as women's agenda issues are now everybody's agenda issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're being dealt with as such. So I, I, I really don't see any distinction now. That's interesting. Well, if you were going to describe yourself, uh, there, there are people who are always trying to put labels on everybody. I'll let you put your own label this time on. Do you consider yourself um, a liberal or conservative or what other category or how would you describe yourself? I really don't like those kinds of terms because, I mean, if you would first tell me what a liberal is or what a conservative is, then I would be happy to respond and say I am or I am not. Uh, but not knowing what your definition is, it's very difficult for me to respond. Um, I, uh, I consider myself um, uh, forward thinking. Yeah. I like to uh, to uh, try to focus as best as I can in this um, 
quagmire of daily things to do on the forest as opposed to uh, being uh, just swamped by the trees. Um, I am not afraid of uh, taking initiatives. Um, I uh, think that uh, it is um, incumbent upon all of us to um, take the lead in many areas uh, without any concern as to the political consequences if it seems as though this is the thing to do. Uh, and um, I, uh, I, I don't think in terms of, uh, of the political consequences as much as perhaps I should uh, if I want to assure re-election from year to year. But quite frankly, that's not a high priority of mine. I, I feel very strongly that um, if I don't do what I uh, am here to do, there's no point in being reelected. Good statement. Really good. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your actually being in the legislature. As a freshman legislator, did you have a mentor or someone who helped you find out where everything was and how everything worked? I surely did. Um, uh, when I was first elected, uh, there were 14 members of the House of Representatives from Johnson County uh, in 1987, <coughs> and there was only one Democratic member out of the 14. I was the second when I was elected in 87, in 86. The other Democratic member who had been in uh, the House for four years prior to my being elected and had served during that time as the only Democrat in the delegation uh, is Gary Blumenthal, who is uh, my next door neighbor and with whom I, here in the offices, and with whom I shared an office during my first four years. Um, and so Gary was indeed a mentor and uh, was extremely helpful to me in, uh, in uh, any number of ways as far as orientation to this process. Well, that's good to you. Now, did you know him for a long time before that? I first met Gary when I ran for the Community College Board of Trustees oh. for the first time in 1981. Gary at that time was a school teacher in Shawnee Mission High School and was serving as the uh, campaign manager of a gal who was running for the Shawnee Mission School Board. Hmm. And she and I had decided to do some joint literature drops during that election, and that's oh, the first time I ever met Gary. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> he was subsequently elected to the, to the well, legislature, and our paths then crossed again. Yeah. Well, uh, you, know, you mentioned that you're the chairman of the Public Health and Welfare, or whatever the name of that committee is now. What other committees do you serve on and have you served on? Um, I, I presently chair uh, Public Health and Welfare in the House, and I'm also the vice chairman of the Economic Development Committee. Uh, in addition, I serve, I'm serving as vice chairman of a newly appointed uh, Committee, committee um, joint committee, it's called, on health care decisions from the 90s. Mm. Uh, that is a statutorily created committee of last year uh, that is composed of uh, the chairpersons and ranking minority members of um, the public health committees in both the House and Senate, insurance committees, mm. and appropriations committees. That sounds like an interesting um, committee. It's kind of a coordinating group for some of these major health care decision thrusts that we're going to have to be involved in. Um, in addition, I serve on the Pensions, Investments, and Benefits Committee and had uh, been its ranking minority member um, during the last mm -hmm. session. Um, and I had previously as well served on the Elections Committee, but I'm not uh, serving on that uh, this session. Um, I also serve on the Joint House and Senate Economic Development 
Committee, mm. and I serve as um, the what was called the ranking minority member of this SRS task force that is an ongoing mm -hmm. operation. Senator Boginer is the chairman of it. I don't know whether my title has changed now that we we have gone from the uh, minority to the majority. <laughs> so I'm, I guess I probably should more accurately say I'm the ranking Democratic member <laughs> of the SRS task force. Yeah, that's a joint, a joint yes, committee. Yes, it's a joint committee. It also has some lay people on it. Um, and in fact, some uh, professors from KU are, mm. are serving on it and um, some business people. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, now, have you held any other leadership positions outside of the committee chair and vice chair? Uh, in the, uh, in the yeah, legislature? Yeah. No, other than just serving on task mm -hmm. as chair of task. Yeah. Uh, now, can you describe the state house power structure during the years that you've been in office? Of course, that's changed dramatically this year. Uh, for you, for you, you've become chairman and vice chairman of some committees. But can you just briefly describe this for the record? Of who, who was the? What do you mean by power structure? Well, who was the speaker of the house, and uh, if there is one? Well, there's been a major change on the house side. And also uh, in the executive branch uh, from uh, last session to this. Um, the Democratic Party is now in control of the House by a scant one vote majority. Is it still that way? Did yes. you vote today? Uh, no, the uh, Democratic challenger withdrew today. And as a result, we never had. Hmm. We uh, were not aware of that until this morning. Hmm. And in fact, uh, everyone was planning to be here for most of the day mm -hmm. in a very uh, prolonged session dealing probably with each and every one of those contested ballots. Uh, but uh, we uh, had no need to do it at all uh, because um, uh, Karen Wellman chose to withdraw her challenge uh, before having the House deal with it this morning. Uh, so we are definitely now 63-62. Uh, uh, but the results of that challenge would not have changed the majority-minority situation in any case because uh, uh, the uh, seated contested um, representative was a Republican. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the leadership in the House, of course, has changed dramatically. Uh, we have a new speaker, and uh, um, uh, Speaker Pro Tem and Majority Leader. Interestingly, our Majority Leader, Donna Whiteman, is the first woman ever to serve in that, in that office. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged uh, because uh, I think very, very highly Marcus, um, and I uh, think that we're going to be able to accomplish some very, very innovative and good things that have that we've been waiting too long to do. Now, outside of the um, this the official structure, have you belonged to any what you call formal or informal coalitions or groups? Like I think last year there was a group of women in the house that. Some people call the Women's Coalition, it just it wasn't official or anything. Have you participated in anything like that? Or? I've participated to the extent that there's been one, but quite frankly, there's been one, but um, in all honesty, uh, I don't think there's been one of any consequence. Okay. Uh, I, I really don't believe there's been any kind of women's coalition of any substance mm -hmm. at all in this legislature. Uh, 
there have been some feeble attempts from time to time, I think, to try to form one. Uh, but um, there, uh, there really hasn't, uh, hasn't been one that's made any difference. There were a group of, of women that uh, voted in similar fashion uh, during our uh, debates last year on a um, parental notification bill mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, subsequently labeled themselves um, the, the steel magnolias. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't think there's anything more in depth to that, uh, <laughs> that little coalition than a simply a, a unified wish to uh, defeat the particular bill that was up for discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just mention very briefly three or four, or maybe one or two, major controversies or issues that you have participated in or that have occurred during your terms in office? I was extremely involved in the uh, SRS debates of last year, um, and in fact uh, took the lead in trying to have some of the cuts that were arbitrarily made by the governor and some of our social um, programs uh, reinstated uh, during the session. Uh, this also led to uh, some fairly uh, heated debates over the SRS budget throughout the session and it went toward the, to the end of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I certainly was in the thick of that. Um, I also uh, uh, became involved in um, some floor debates on uh, ethics legislation, which is very controversial. Uh, I uh, felt that uh, the body should have gone uh, quite a few steps further than they chose to go, and uh, I tried to persuade my colleagues to think as I did on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this during the past session, I, uh, th those were probably the two areas that uh, I was most involved in controversy mm -hmm. on. What about your uh, memories of any uh, humorous situations or horrendous situations that you found yourself in? Anything like that personally that's happened to you since you? I think probably one of the funniest um, involved um, the reason why some some of my some of my colleagues even today call me Catfish Carol, which is kind kind of strange, as you can probably tell from the way I speak. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I haven't lived there for 33 years, but I am absolutely convinced I will never lose this Brooklyn accent. But I am certainly a um, urban product and live now as well in an urban area as opposed to one of the more rural areas in our state. Um, during, uh, this must have been two years ago or three years ago, uh, during the break between the regular session and the veto session, uh, we are at home for a couple of weeks. And a constituent of mine called me and asked if he could speak with me and visit with me during that period um, to tell me about um, fish farming uh, legislation in, can in, in the state that he was most interested in because although he was a resident of Oberlin Park. He and his wife earned their livelihood as fish haulers. They, they have trucks and they haul fish and, and, and uh, provide the fish uh, to private ponds. And uh, that's their business. And he had a real interest in, um, in uh, some um, uh, fish farming legislation. Ooh. And um, when we returned for the veto session, uh, there was a bill that was um, under discussion on the House floor on fish farms. And um, I had discussed some information that I had learned about this with the sponsor of that bill, who was a freshman legislator. 
prior to his arguing on the floor in support of his bill. Um, and uh, during the debate on that bill, some veteran legislator came to the microphone to question this freshman legislator on his fish farming bill and um, asked him some questions, one of which was, well, just how many fish farms are there in the state of Kansas? And uh, this freshman representative looked at him and said, well, I didn't know but Representative Sater tells me there are 52. And I sat at, sat at that time at the very back <coughs> of the house, and if you could see the faces that turned around because of all the unlikely people in the body that would be into that kind of information, it was probably me. So people were kind of uh, taken aback by the fact that I was um, I was uh, the expert on fish farming <laughs> and have not lived it down since. Well, that was it was a that was a funny incident. Well, <laughs> well um, how many women were in the house when you first went into office when you were sworn in? Were there? I'm not certain. It was under thirty. Under thirty, and then there are thirty five. Yeah, I there think are, there were about twenty seven. Yeah, I think it may be in the high twenties. So it's it's increased, it's increased each year. Okay, well, I want to ask you a few questions now about you just personally. And you told me you were from Brooklyn. Uh, how long have you lived in Kansas? I gather you're not a native Kansas. That's right? for you sure. You didn't right. go from here to there. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where, where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Um, uh, left there when I graduated from school and oh. got married uh, in 1957. Came to Kansas in 1976. And have been here ever since. Okay. Uh, did you grow up then in Brooklyn? Yes. Yeah, how would you describe your family and growing up there, just briefly? I um, was raised by my mother, who was a school teacher. Um, taught, she taught the first grade in public school in Brooklyn, New York, for 40 years. Um, I have uh, a, one sister who is 19 months older than I am and who is a, uh, an attorney, lives in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Um, my uh, father was also an attorney. Uh, my father became ill when I was um, six years old and uh, was subsequently hospitalized and uh, was in a Veterans Administration hospital for eight years with a degenerative central nervous mm. uh, condition uh, and passed away when I was 16. So my mother really was the sole support and, uh, of my sister and myself. And um, uh, I think she did a fantastic job. She was a, a real role model mm. for us. No, oh, that's interesting. Now, uh, where did you go to school? And, uh, I went to Midwood High School in Brooklyn, New York, and then uh, to Barnard College, which is uh, the women's counterpart of Columbia University mm -hmm. in uh, New York City. And I majored in government and uh, minored in education uh, in uh, deference to my mother's request that we be able to teach if we ever needed to. <laughs> my <laughs> so sister and I both had no choice but to do that. Uh, and um, in fact, did teach school for one year uh, and uh, decided I didn't really like that a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I graduated from Barnard with a BA in 1957. Uh, now, you mentioned the uh, League of Women Voters. What other organizations have you belonged to? Now, I'm sure that was an influence on you and running for political office in some respect. Do you belong to any other organizations that could have been an influence, maybe? Many. 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 What, what are yeah. some? Uh, I've been very involved uh, with the United Community Services in Johnson County, which is a coordinating body or uh, social service agencies mm -hmm. and, and causes. Um, I've uh, 
also been uh, extremely involved in uh, with uh, a number of uh, religious oriented service agencies the um, uh, Jewish vocational service uh, and uh, Jewish community uh, relations board um, I've served on um, quite a number of um, county um, task forces uh, and on the Transportation Advisory Council of the county for years and have, am still involved in uh, uh, projects trying to provide mass transit for, for individuals in, in our county. Well, now, these organizations, did they really prepare you or with no knowledge about the issues or just the processes that uh, they're organized by, or, or how, how would you say they influence you? I, I think <coughs> they influence in that they provide a tremendous amount of experience in dealing with people mm -hmm. and in leadership skills and in organizational skills. And I think community service work provides a fantastic base for um, all of those skills. I mean, it is a wonderful training ground. And uh, of course, I did it for many, many, many mm -hmm. years. Um, and uh, I, I can't think of any experience that could be better mm -hmm. preparation for uh, entering the public arena mm -hmm. than um, very involved community service. Uh, one thing where we've kind of identified is a lot of people were debaters. Did you ever debate anywhere? No. Okay. That's no, I did not. Kind of an added question. Mm -hmm. are, are you married? You yes. Have family? Yes, I, I certainly am. Um, I, my husband is Harold Seda, and uh, we married in 1957. We met in high school. I was, uh, our high school was run like the city of New York, and uh, I was president of the city <coughs> council and he was president of his class and we met on the board of estimate uh, in my sophomore year in high school and um, uh, we, uh, we've we been together ever since. Uh, Hal uh, went to Harvard College uh, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts and uh, majored in economics and uh, then he um, went to graduate school at Columbia University and got an MBA in, in business. And uh, interestingly, we graduated together. He's oh. a year older than I, and so we, uh, we graduated together in 1957 in the one Columbia University graduation ceremony and uh, got married five days later. Uh, Pretty good planning. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And uh, we have three children. Um, our oldest is a son, 32, uh, who's a attor practicing attorney in Kansas City and also a member of the Overland Park City Council. And uh, his name is Neil, and uh, he has served as my campaign manager oh, every time I've run. And Neil was bitten by the political bug many, many years before it ever came to me. Oh. And in fact, he was a uh, very strong influence on my getting involved in this process. Yeah. It is indeed. Unusual. He, uh, he actually worked on the um, domestic policy staff at the White House uh, during uh, President Carter's administration. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Neil is married to Bitsy, who is, uh, her real name is Elizabeth, who is a um, CPA uh, and works for TWA. And they have uh, a little baby, oh. uh, our little granddaughter, Samantha, who is six months old. And then our second child is Randy, and Randy is uh, 30 years old, our daughter. And uh, Randy is a uh, psychiatric social worker by profession. She has her MSW from uh, KU. And uh, she is married to our son-in-law, Bill, who is also a social worker by profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have two little boys, uh, three and a half and one and a half. 
um, Mikey and Robbie. And our third child and youngest is uh, Elisa, who is 23 years old. And Elisa graduated from Harvard uh, College uh, a year ago, two years ago, and took a year off to work and is now a first year law student at George Washington University oh. in Washington, D.C. Yeah. So we're really proud of our you kids should be. and our grandkids. That's and, uh, only, my only concern right now is that I have too limited time to spend with them. Well, now, you, uh, they were all grown and, and probably away at college at least before you ran the first time, is that right? Yes, by design. Uh -huh. By design. Alice? I ran when my youngest uh, child uh, went to college. And how old were you when you first ran? I was 51. Okay. Several people have that same age. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and what was your occupation prior to running? Uh, legal editor. You were legal editor. Yes, uh -huh. okay. quite a number of years. All right, and uh, did you still try to do that for a while? You said you hadn't been doing much lately. Okay. Right. I tried to continue okay. doing it for a while. I was in the fortunate position of having uh, doing it on a freelance basis at the time I decided oh. to run. Um, so it was uh, it was manageable. Uh, but as my uh, responsibilities increased, mm -hmm. uh, my interest in continuing to do that decreased. And um, I, uh, I really have uh, virtually subcontracted it all mm -hmm. out at this point. Uh, did you stay in Topeka, or have you been staying in Topeka? You, you commute, you don't try to commute back and forth. No, I uh, rent an apartment here. And I um, come up very, very early on Monday morning and go home on Friday evenings. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one, one interesting uh, little sidelight of that is uh, when, uh, when I ran the first time and won and my youngest child went off to college, uh, she was uh, convinced that um, my husband and I were going to suffer terribly from an empty nest syndrome. And quite frankly, it lasted 10 minutes. But, <laughs> but she doesn't think that. And uh, prior to her uh, going to school, we had, we had had a little dog, uh, Yorkshire Terrier, for 14 years, who died shortly before her, uh, she left. Uh, and, uh, you know, they say that's when life begins, mm -hmm. when the youngest one leaves and right. the dog dies. And <laughs> <laughs> but she came home at Christmas time during her freshman year. And in, um, in combination with my older daughter, um, decided that um, this house was pretty empty. Um, I think the problem was that Elisa came into the kitchen one morning when she was home on that first winter break, and I was feeding the fish in, in the fish tank, and I spoke to them, <laughs> saying, it's time for breakfast, fellas. And she thought, uh-uh, <laughs> this is it. Mother's gone round the bend. And two nights later, this little puppy dog walked down the, the hallway to our bedroom as a present from the kids mm -hmm. and a little miniature schnauzer uh, who is now five years old and is my co-pilot and, <laughs> and roommate in my apartment in Topeka because I have absolutely nothing else to do with it. Oh, really? And sure, she comes with me well, every, <laughs> every Monday, comes home every Friday. And so Abby has um, been in the legislature as long as I have. <laughs> Well, you've just been telling me all the things that are in the next question. Okay. How has being in the in the legislature affected your life? And I can see it's, Well, I mean, it's as my husband <laughs> kindly put it one day, when um, things were particularly hairy, he said, and this shows you how kind he is, he says, this is somewhat unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> well... Do you think that uh, being in the legislature has changed how other people see you or treat you? Maybe outside of your family or maybe inside your family? Not within my family, that's mm -hmm. for sure. But I think, yes, outside the family. Mm -hmm. yeah. People have a, um, a confused conception 
I think, of, uh, of what we do. Um, many people don't even know when you're home and when you're in session. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I'll be in the supermarket and uh, when we're not in session and I'll meet somebody and they'll say, why are you here, you know, aren't yeah. you supposed to be somewhere else? Uh, they're a, a little bit confused by it. They also uh, oftentimes are not sure uh, how to differentiate between the federal, state, and That's local elected officials. Um, uh, uh, one, <laughs> one anecdote. Um, on New Year's Eve, we were at a, a uh, party at a club, and we were dancing, and it was like two minutes before midnight, and a lady came up to us on the dance floor and, and, and uh, touched my shoulder to talk to me and started telling me about this pothole in her street. <laughs> and uh, my husband just looked at her and said, we're not doing street tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so people are, you know, not exactly sure what you do from time to time, um, but for the most part they are. There are just some who fall into that category. <laughs> well, do you think this has had an effect on your family, your being in the legislature's affected yeah. your family? Yeah. I think there is an effect, yes. Uh, I think it's a uh, sacrifice, uh, not only on my part, but definitely on the part of my spouse and, uh, and children and grandchildren. Uh, it's very demanding of time, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very all-consuming kind of activity, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you well know. Um, and um, it, it, it does take its toll. Mm -hmm. I, I have no, no well, question I about that. There are difficult, difficulties that it poses. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. Uh, do you think that in the in the years that you've been here, that the expectations about what women in the House or Senate would do has changed? Do you think uh, that's? I think the um, uh, impression of the uh, contribution uh, that women can make uh, has changed. Uh, I think that um, the credibility and respect for the quality of work that the women um, are providing um, has increased tremendously. And I think it's quantifiable in the um, fact that um, when I first came, which was just four years ago, um, five years ago, five years ago um, there was only one woman chairing the committee, mm -hmm. and that was education, Debbie Act. Yeah. Now we have many, mm -hmm. and chairing committees that you would not normally expect as traditional areas that women would be would be chairing. And last year was the same. So I think uh, Speaker Braden made major inroads in that area. He appointed women to chair uh, Agriculture Committee, Economic Development Committee, uh, and uh, uh, Speaker Barkas has gone even further, and uh, I, I, I see a noticeable, noticeable increase. And I think we've earned it, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I think we've earned it. <clears throat> well, along the same line that I mentioned earlier, uh, that we have come across some figures that uh, when there were never more than four women in the House prior to 1975. And we're looking for an answer as to why the women in the House have increased so much since 1975. What happened in 75? Uh, what, what could you say triggered this? Do you have any, any ideas? No, I can only conjecture. Uh, I think um, it's part of the general uh, emancipation of women.
Okay, General. I, I think I think it's in part due to the general um, uh, um, increase in women in the workforce. Uh, I think uh, you will find that many, many more women now are not at home, not involved in the child rearing as they were in my earlier days. Um, and so they're able to have the luxury of looking at differing options as far as careers are concerned. I think another factor is that, uh, you know, for so many years, Women have been behind the scenes in politics. They've been <coughs> campaign helpers, they've been lobbyists, they've been uh, helpmates. And I think um, the sociological change in women's positions uh, has moved many from that helpmate kind of mode into the doer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it has permitted them to actually uh, become the office seeker rather than the helper of the office seeker. Um, in addition, uh, I think many women have now come to realize that they can in fact effect change, that they can make a difference, and they have the um, financial capability and the self-confidence and the independence to uh, look upon politics now uh, as a career rather than as a cause. I think uh, the, the women of, uh, of my generation uh, really viewed it more as a cause, yeah. and now I think that is shifting to a view as a career. A real interesting idea. Is there anything that I haven't asked you <coughs> that you would like to tell us, tell me? I think you've covered, <laughs> many, covered the waterfront. <laughs> you've covered the waterfront indeed. Uh, I think it's been a very comprehensive inquiry and I appreciate your asking.